Why the term natural law in the first place? Now, Murray Rothbard claims that natural law theory rests on the insight that each entity has distinct and specific properties, a distinct nature which can be investigated by man's reason. For a new liberty, page, uh, if, if, a quote from page new liberty, uh, for a new liberty, page 25, sorry. And that man has rights because they are natural rights. They are grounded in the nature of man. Ethics of liberty, page 155. To put it bluntly, this form of <laughs> analysis was originated by Aristotle and has not been used by science for centuries. Science investigates by proposing theories and hypotheses to explain empirical observations, testing, and refining them by experiment. In stark contrast, Rothbard invents definitions, distinct natures, and then draws conclusions from them. Such a method was last used by the medieval church and is devoid of any scientific method. It is, of course, a fiction. It attempts to deduce the nature of a natural society from a priori considerations of the innate nature of human beings, which just means that the assumptions necessary to reach the desired conclusions have been built into the definition of human nature. In other words, Rothbard defines humans as having the distinct and specific properties that, given his assumptions, will allow his dogma, private state capitalism, to be inferred as the natural society for humans. Rothbard claims that if A, B, C, etc. have differing attributes, it follows that they have different natures. The Ethics of Liberty, page 9. If, uh, does this mean that every individual is unique, having different attributes? They have different natures? Skin and hair color are different attributes. Does this mean that red-haired people have different natures than blondes? That black people have different natures than white people? And such a theory of natural law, by the way, was actually used to justify slavery. Yes, slaves are human, but they have different natures than their masters. And so, well, slavery's okay, was exactly how that argument went down. And yes, Rothbard supported it. Of course, Rothbard aggregates attributes to species levels, but why not higher? Humans are primates. Does that mean we have the same natures as monkeys or gorillas? Well, we are also mammals as well. We share many of the same attributes as whales and dogs. Do we have similar, na similar natures? But this but is, by the way... To continue, you find that after uh, defining certain natures, Rothbard attempts to derive natural rights and laws from them. However, these natural laws are, well, <laughs> quite strange, as they can be violated in nature. Real natural laws, you know, like gravity, cannot be violated and therefore do not need to be enforced. The natural laws the libertarian desires to foist upon us are, well, not like this. They need to be enforced by humans and the institutions they create. Hence, libertarian natural laws are more akin to moral prescriptions or jurisdictional laws. However, this doesn't stop Rothbard explicitly placing his natural laws alongside physical or scientific natural laws. See Ethics of Liberty, page 42. So... Why do so many libertarians use the term natural law? Hell, why do so many people in general, especially in conspiracy theory circles, use the term natural law? Simply, it gives them the means by which to elevate their opinions, dogmas, and prejudices to a metaphysical level where nobody will dare to criticize or even think about them. The term smacks of religion where natural law has simply replaced God's will. The latter fiction gave the priest power over believers. Natural law is designed to give the ideal, uh, libertarian ideologist power over the people that they want to rule. So, how can one be against a natural law or a natural right? It's impossible. How can one argue against gravity? If private property, for example, is elevated to such a level, who would dare argue against it? Ayn Rand listed having landlords and employers along with the laws of nature. They're not similar. The first two are social relationships which have been imposed by the state. The laws of nature like gravity or eating food are facts that don't need to be imposed. Rothbard claims that the natural fact is that labor service is indeed a commodity. However, this is complete nonsense. Labor service as a commodity is a social fact, dependent on the distribution of property within a society, its social customs, and so forth. It's only natural in the sense that it exists within a given society. The state is also natural as it also exists within nature at any given time, but neither wage slavery or the state is natural in the sense that gravity is natural or humans having 
by default, typically, two arms is natural. Indeed, workers at the dawn of capitalism, faced with selling their labor services to another, considered it as decidedly unnatural and used the term wage slavery to describe it. Thus, where and when a fact appears is essential. For example, Rothbard claims that an apple let fall will drop to the ground. This we all observe and acknowledge to be in the nature of the apple. Ethics of Liberty, page 9. Actually, we don't acknowledge anything of the kind. We acknowledge that the apple was subject to the force of gravity, and that's why it fell. The same apple let fall in a spaceship would not drop to the floor. Has the nature of the apple changed? No, but the situation it is in has changed. Thus, any attempt to generate abstract natures require, uh, requires you to ignore reality in favor of ideals. Because of the confusion of its usage, uh, because of the confusion its usage creates, we're tempted to think that the use of natural law dogma is attempt is an attempt to stop thinking, to restrict analysis, to force certain aspects of society off the political agenda by giving them a divine, everlasting quality. Moreover, such an individualist account of the origins of rights will always turn on a muddled distinction between individual rationality and some vague notion of rationality associated with membership of the human species. How are we to determine what is rational for an individual as an individual uh, as an individual and what is rational for that same individual as a human being? It's hard to see that we can make such a distinction for if I violently interfere with Murray Rothbard's freedom, this may violate the natural law of Murray Rothbard's needs, but it doesn't violate the natural law of my needs. This is L.A. Rollins in The Myth of Natural Rights, page 28. Both parties, after all, are human. And if such interference is, as Rothbard claims, anti-human, then why, if it helps me, a human, to advance my life, then how can it be unequivocally anti-human? Page 27. Same citation. Thus, natural law is contradictory as it is as well within the bounds of human nature to violate it. This means that in order to support the dogma of natural law, the cultists must ignore reality. Ayn Rand claims that the source of man's rights is the law of identity. A is A. Man is man. But Rand, like Rothbard, defines man as an entity of a specific kind, a rational being, virtue of selfishness, page 94 to 95. Therefore, she cannot account for irrational human behaviors, such as those that violate natural laws, which are also products of our nature. To assert that such behaviors are not human is to assert that A cannot be A, thus contradicting the law of identity. Her ideology cannot even meet its own test.